Hello once again, everybody. Thank you for joining me here on this special edition of Bang the Book Radio for Tuesday, July 16th. We're going to chat about the Open Championship, or probably better known as the British Open, with Brian Blessing, the host of Sportsbook Radio and Vegas Hockey Hotline. We have a phenomenal preview for the Open Championship over at bangthebook.com from our new golf writer, James Mazzola. Make sure you follow him on Twitter at jmaz with two Zs, JD. A great preview there. I've got my daily fantasy up for the Open Championship as well. So we've got you fully covered over at bangthebook.com. And my guest here today, Brian Blessing, did a video for us last week on the British Open on our YouTube page. He'll probably take another look at it here with us this week on video, but also here on this edition of Bang the Book Radio. Brian, how's it going today, man? All right, bud. Just uh, <laughs> trying to get the uh, the sleep schedule organized. Uh, that's the crazy thing about this. Uh, it's tough enough for you, but when we get this on the West Coast, uh, they'll tee off around 1030 at night on Wednesday night. And uh, I usually make it to about 2, 3 in the morning, and then the DVRs crank and then get back up at 536 and try to race and catch up and then catch the end live. So th- that's the one thing is how we have to adjust our time clock. Yeah, we really do. And, you know, it's kind of interesting that we start with that point because a lot of really good PGA Tour players played the Irish Open two weeks ago or played the Scottish Open last week to sort of get themselves acclimated a little bit to that time change, to the different conditions over in Europe. So when you factor that into the handicap, Brian, as sort of a starting point, do you look for those guys that, you know, have already been over there playing? Uh, Yeah, I mean, it's getting the you know, getting the body clock adjust is part of it. I think it's more adapting to more of the links nature of things and, and getting that repertoire in your bag uh, that you're so used to flag hunting and throwing darts in the air that keeping it on the ground, especially if the wind and rain kicks up, uh, you know, that's your out and the safer of the, of the two shots. And, you know, being over there and having a tournament or two tournaments under your belt with that style uh, I think is, is the most beneficial thing that guys get out of this. All right. And as we look at this course here, Royal Portrush in Northern Ireland, the first time that this course has hosted the open championship since 1951, only the second time ever. And you and I were kind of talking about this before we start, before we hit the record button here that we have no course form data whatsoever for any of these guys really in this tournament this did host an amateur championship back in 2014 but a lot of guys getting their first exposure to this course playing the practice rounds here this week or if they came over last week probably getting some rounds in there so what are we kind of looking at from this course here I mean are we looking for the usual hallmarks of an open championship wind rain links you know very penal rough is it the usual type of course yeah I was listening to Darren Clark uh, his interview the other day. Obviously, Darren Clark, Rory McIlroy. Clark has a house on the course. Uh, he's going to hit the fish first shot of the tournament. McIlroy, Graham McDowell, um, these are guys that know this course. Uh, McIlroy shot a 61 here when he was 16. So from a familiarity aspect, guys like that have an edge. Uh, you know, you still have to go out and execute. And then I think it, it, it's also, as much as it's learning the course, it's knowing what the wind's going to do. And that was one of the things that Clark was talking about, that uh, they come out of the gate in the first seven holes. uh, You might play into the wind, and then when they turn at number seven uh, with the prevailing wind, things would lighten up a little bit. So I I think for a lot of these guys, as is the case with basically any round, but I think getting off to a good start and most importantly, not getting off to a disastrous start is critical. Well, and that's the tough thing here. You know, we we kind of look at a lot of these courses as, you know, this is a course for bombers. This is a course for guys that hit fairways and make putts. This is a course for guys that, you know, play real well on approach because a lot of the greens are heavily protected. We tend to have, you know, a theme for every event, for every course that we go to. And these open championships, these events that are over in very windy areas, it's a real challenge because, yeah, you want a punisher. You want a guy that can bomb the ball through the wind. But at the same time, if the wind's at your back, club selection is extremely important. So what 
types of attributes are you looking for in the players here this week that you're going to have on your card? Well, I would say this to you. I, I think it's a big learning curve, and honestly, I, I you know I'm going to have some guys out of the gate, but I honestly believe uh, you'll have a pretty congested leaderboard, and I think you'll be able to really find some guys uh, watching the first two rounds and still get a real nice price on uh, Friday night or Friday afternoon, as it would be with the earlier starts. Um, bombers, uh, that's this again. These are things Darren Clark was talking about. It's funny you get all the interviews and you listen to all these guys. And it's all well and good. It's interesting. But to hear what a guy like that's saying, who really has you know, so much information in his toolbox, and he says he's telling these guys everything, he says, I should probably shut up uh, when he talks to his friends and competitors. But the, the Bombers, he said, it's all about angles with this place. If you hit your lines, uh, but there are areas, and there's some significant dog legs where they can cut the corner. Uh, but if they are errant cutting the corner, uh, they can get in real trouble, you know, and and put up a balloon number. So there could be a guy that's you know playing great, all of a sudden gets a little too uh, feisty off the tee, tries to bite off more than he he wants to, and all of a sudden the snowman pops up on the scorecard. So uh, Tiger, I know he's got the two iron, he's got the driving iron in the bag uh, at the British Open. You know that low stinger shot's really effective. I uh, mean everybody's shooting holes at Tiger about his prep for this and you know how it's all going to pan out, but from a plan of attack, you know, and ball striking and, and honestly, guys didn't know how to compete in this event. Um, you, know, you think of the guys over the years, Tom Watson won so many, could have won when he was older than 60. Louis Ustase and always shows up on the board in these things. Um, so there are horses for courses with the style of play to, for starters. Yeah, and, you know, one of the – there were a few really cool nuggets that I got from James Mazzola's preview over at bangthebook.com here. A couple of these to mention, I want to do expand on these. Uh, I want to expand on these a little bit here as well. 13 of the last 19 British Open champions had won a tournament the same season. So this makes some sense to me in the sense that you, know, you want a guy that knows how to finish off a win because you just talked about it. Guys are going to go out there. They're going to be playing real well. Then all of a sudden they get a snowman on a par five or you know they shoot a seven on a par four, something like that. They have that one hole that kind of screws it all up for them. And then also one of the things that James talked about looking for, you know, three putt avoidance guys that are going to get the GIR and not give strokes back by missing putts, because this is a course where you hit some of those errant shots, as you just mentioned, all of a sudden you're in significant trouble. So I think you're looking for guys that avoid the really bad holes. And those are typically guys that, you know, can finish off the win in golf tournaments. There's no doubt. And then there's the learning curve. I think the greens, you know, Derek Clark again was talking about, well, they're, they're going to get the greens, you know, where they want them to be. They're going to get them to 10 and a half. Okay. You know, like that, that's lightning fast for a European tour event. Uh, you know, I mean, you get a British Open where they could be 12, 12 and a half, 13. Uh, so uh, there's that. It, it may be one of the biggest adjustments. And that's, I think, also why guys come over and play earlier is to get a flow to their putting game on much slower greens. All right. So as we look at some of the past winners here of open championships, I mean, it's a lot of who's who types of guys, you know, it is hard to get a guy that comes way off the board to win these types of things. Francesco Molinari last year at Carnoustie, which played very, very tough. The winning score there only eight under Jordan Spieth when he was one of the best ball strikers in the game at Royal Burkdale. Henrik Stenson at Royal Troon back in 16. Zach Johnson, not a long hitter at all, but a straight hitter, a guy that makes putts at St. Andrews in 2015. Rory in 14 at Royal Liverpool. Phil Mickelson, 2013. The second one for Ernie Els in 2012. Clark, who we've referenced a lot in 2011. So you've kind of got an interesting group of guys here. You've got some bombers, but you really have a lot of guys that pick it clean and don't have any big weaknesses in their games. And I think that's, again, what you want to look for here with handicapping this tournament, guys that are average or better in just about all of the key areas. Well, yeah, you brought up the Zach Johnson win, and uh, that's one of my favorite tournaments of all time. Uh, don't you wish they could all be like this? I had Zach Johnson at 120-1 to 1 and had uh, you know, Mark Leishman, who was in the playoffs, and Louis Ustase, literally, it was like it was it was one of those things. Sit back, relax, watch, and enjoy. 
uh, to have the guys that were in the playoffs actually had a ticket on, on those three guys. Um, so, but it, but it speaks volumes to Zach Johnson, you know, fairways and greens, you know, and he put extremely well. And, and and a guy like Zach Johnson, you know, again we go back to lanes, and I'm not saying he, he's the guy this week, but he has a low piercing ball flight, and all he does is hit it straight. So he wasn't biting off more than he could chew and, and put well that week. And if you remember that tournament at St Andrews, it was ridiculously windy. So you know, in that vein, I think. Ball flight is a big thing here, too. The guys that are going to be able to keep it low, I think, are going to have a big edge. Well, as you look at the runners up here over the last decade or so, last year you had four of them tied at two shots back. Kisner, McElroy, Justin Rose, Xander Schauffele. Kucher was runner up in 17, Phil in 16, Leishman and Ustazen, as we just mentioned, in 15, Fowler Garcia, 14, Stenson, 13, Adam Scott in 2012. Dustin Johnson and lefty in 2011 Westwood in 2010, when he was still, you know, uh, towards the top of his game, Tom Watson in 09 Poulter in 08 Garcia again in 07. So again, the winners and the guys at the top of the board, generally the best of the best. And what's nice about a tournament like this, Brian, is that the board is so loaded that you've got some very, very strong players in that 25 to 50 to one range. So, you know, even though you've got Rory, the favorite below eight to one, Kepka, the second favorite below 10 to one, you know, you've got some very, very strong players that, you know, pretty decent numbers that we don't typically see them at. No. And I think, I think the other thing too, Adam, and we were chatting about this a little bit for many, many years, I always believed the PGA championship was the most wide open of the majors. I think that's changed. I think the PGA setup wise in recent years has really started to mirror the U S open a lot more than it did in the past. And I just think the British open is the most wide open of the lot. Now I think you do bring in a number of European players in who come over and have a good week and this is what they do. So I think there's some European guys uh, that can step up to the plate. And then there are some of these guys that are always knocking on the door on the PGA tour that all of a sudden could have a great week, but they have a different, you know, again, the ball flight could be the big difference here. And it comes down to a putting tournament at the end of the day, who's going to make the putts? Cause there'll be 30 guys that are going to come and have a really good week, ball striking. And then it comes down to who makes the putt. So your first thing you're trying to do is, is narrow the field down to the 25, 30 guys you think are playing well enough then it's the guy who's going to get the hot hand with the, with the flat stick. So as we look at this field here, 47 of the top 50 in the FedEx Cup chase, 84 of the top 85 in the official world golf ranking. On hand for this one, a little over 7,300 yards of par 72 here at Royal Portrush. And again, obviously weather can be a big factor. You and I were talking about this earlier. Chance of rain every day because that's just the nature of the game here when you talk about the open Wind will be a factor, could be a bigger factor in the morning some days, bigger factor in the afternoon on other days. So, you know, you want to make sure you're trying to check out that forecast as much as you possibly can. So I don't think either one of us are on the two favorites here this week, Brian, but I do want to talk about them for obvious reasons here, beginning with Rory McIlroy. As you mentioned, shot a 61 at 16 years old on this course, won the players earlier this year, uh, has a couple of wins this season little under eight to one. And Rory's a deserving favorite here, correct? think so, yeah. And now to the weather, and again, you're trusting the weather forecast, and the weather can change on a dime over there. Uh, but there, this happens in a lot of regular events. It certainly happens in the British Open. Uh, it, right now, if the forecast we're getting, and I don't know that it's going to be that drastic, but it sounds like, Thursday is an equal playing field, but Friday afternoon, uh, rain could kick, kick up on Friday afternoon. So if you look at the first two days, in that clump of guys that are playing, uh, and there's some great players in there, you could say conceivably they would get the worst of the draw the first couple of days. But you, I'll just rattle off a bunch uh, in that afternoon wave, uh, you know, name players, let's see. Uh, Webb Simpson, Sergio Garcia, Stenson, Shoffley, McDowell, uh, Molinari, DeChambeau, Adam Scott, 
This is a pairing, McElroy, Woodland, and Casey with a 310 tee off on Friday. Fowler, Kisner, Matsuyama. Uh, so I, those are the biggest names, I think, that are playing and conceivably could get the worst of the tee times. I, it's not the end-all, be-all, but it, it's something to consider at least. But McElroy is in that group that will play on Friday afternoon. But th- I think the other thing you got to take into account is it's a major and there's tons of pressure to begin with. And it's great. You're going to have raucous fan support. Uh, yeah, a guy could run away and hide. But I would think uh, the guys would put so much more energy into this. And McElroy and McDowell, these guys you know, playing in front of their home fans, uh, that's an added dose of pressure. Speaking of pressure, Brooks Kepka hasn't really felt any in majors really for the last two years. I mean, it's unbelievable what this guy does in these major events on what are supposed to be the most difficult courses with the strongest fields. So he's plus 975 here this week. I, in fact, I actually saw he's a dog in a matchup to McElroy, which is kind of interesting to talk about in and of itself. But what about Kepka? I mean, obviously it's hard to bet against this guy in any way, shape, or form, but you know, the British is a little bit different than the other three majors in the U.S. So what do you think about Kepka this week? I'm like, it's hard to discount him in any major. I mean, it's the focus and uh, the demeanor he has and his, his approach with every shot, it, it, you know, that he, he just has this laser focus, uh, doesn't panic if he's behind a few shots, uh, hits middle of greens if he's ahead. Uh, so his strategy and – Everything he employs when he's in a major, you can't criticize. Now, he opened 6-1. to one, He's up to 10-1. to one. McElroy came down from 10-8. to eight. Uh, You know, the one guy, and again, you know, it, sometimes it's when you bet. I'm kicking myself a little bit. Sure enough, I bet Spenson last week, which was the dumb thing, and he contended didn't win. But because he played well last week, Stenson went from 40 to 30. And Stenson hits a three-wood. He hits it like a bullet. And he hits three-wood as far as most guys hits driver. So uh, Stenson in good form, his number's down. I kind of like Stenson a little bit. But I will tell you, the last time we saw him and was John Rahm. Uh, you know, he won the Irish Open. And I thought I was in the catbird seat. I just took a little flyer in that tournament, took Eddie Pepperell. And Pepperell was sitting in the next to last group with two guys that had shot a 60 and 62 the day before ahead of him going, well, they're not going to be there. It's impossible to follow up rounds like that. And Pepperell had a so so fighter i think he shot two under but he was the guy in a catbird seat and rom shoots a 62 or whatever it was so john rom is coming in here feeling his oats uh for a guy that's never won a major down to 16 to one so rom is your third favorite here you know uh, somewhere in the 14 to 16 to one range as you mentioned one guy i do want to talk about dustin johnson he's around 15 to one here and and we got real accustomed to seeing dustin johnson Seven and a half to one, six to one, eight to one in that type of range for these big time events here. Now all of a sudden he's at fifteen. Is, is he kind of being overlooked, or is this just not the best of fits for him? I think it's probably a combination of that. And uh, you know, in the majors, wasn't uh, setting the world on fire. I think the U.S. Open was a massive disappointment at Pebble Beach, uh, where to me, I, I thought. I thought he was going to be dominant in the, at Pebble Beach, and he just didn't play that well. Uh, current form, uh, DJ's just not on top of his game right now. That doesn't mean he can't wake up. But, I mean, we, we can say that, you know, go down the line. I mean, Justin Spieth up to 40-1 to 1 with horrible, horrible current form. But we see Justin Spieth, even now, through the travails he has, he can get the putter going. So, you know, you get Spieth at a, at a crazy overlaid price. But, I mean, his demeanor, he just seems to be in a weird place. Um, you know, Kuchar, then Kuchar's 40 to one down to 30 to one. Uh, Matt Kuchar has been, maybe, I think you could make the case, not necessarily in terms of winning. Uh, Kuchar may be the most consistent golfer on the planet right now. You know, I think it's real interesting, actually. I don't mean to, uh, to point out where you misspoke there, but I know you call him Justin speed and, and it's kind of funny to think about you know, sort of lumping Justin Thomas and Jordan speed together, Speed, the guy that, again, was one of the top ball strikers just a couple of years ago, won this event in 2017, obviously at a different course. And then there's Justin Thomas, who 
when he's going well, may be the most consistent player on the entire PGA Tour, but had that wrist injury earlier on in the year. And again, I, I don't mean to, to point fun at the fact that you called him Justin Spieth, but it's one of those things where I feel like both of those guys have the right type of skill sets to go out and win this tournament, but they are kind of muddled with this group of the 30 to 40 to one guys, you know, Thomas for the injury and Spieth because consistency just hasn't been his thing. No, and I, I'm glad you mentioned uh, Justin Thomas too, because he had the wrist injury. Uh, this is a guy that can just flat out light it up and go low, no matter what kind of golf he's playing or where he is. And bouncing back from the wrist injury, first and foremost, you got to can a guy play four rounds? Is, is he get healthy? Is his game trending the right way? And he was in contention in the uh, uh, Scottish Open, right? He shot 18 under par. So, yeah, Justin Thomas has got to be coming in here feeling pretty good about himself. All right, so as we look around the rest of the board here, let's, let's focus on some of the regulars on the European Tour. You know, you've got, I guess Tommy Fleetwood's not necessarily a regular anymore, but he's 21 to 1. A lot of people figure he'll have one of these big breakthroughs in a major here at some point. Uh, Rafael Cabrera Bayo, again, not necessarily a European Tour regular, but three straight top 10s on the European Tour coming into this one. You mentioned Eddie Pepperell, who you had in that Irish Open. Burt Wiesberger won last week uh, at the Scottish Open. Matthew Fitzpatrick has kind of been that guy that everyone's always talked about as the next big thing from the European Tour. Hasn't really broken through. What about those guys? And I also lump a guy like Alex Noren in there as well, who always plays well uh, in some of these bigger European Tour events. What about those European Tour guys? I mean, do they have any sort of leg up here this weekend? I think the playing field's level to a degree, sure, with familiarity of the style of play. It's funny, this is how wide open it is, because you rattle off a bunch of guys that certainly can contend. I'll, I'll throw a few others at you. A guy I've, I've been all over it on and just have not cashed. Uh, and he gets a, he gets some pub, but Matt Wallace had three wins last year in the European Tour. He's content, He contended in the U.S. Open. Uh so the cat's out of the bag about Matt Wallace a little bit. Fleetwood, obviously, I think is underachieved this year. Uh, I thought Fleetwood was going to have a much better year. I will have a ticket on Eddie Pepperell. Uh, don't forget, Eddie Pepperell had a great final round at Sawgrass in the Players' Championship. Uh, and Eddie Pepperell's a guy that can go low and you know was top five in the uh, Irish Open. So I would look at a guy like that. But I, there are so many guys. Um, but you mentioned you know, Wallace to me is the guy that uh, maybe in terms of kicking the door down on the European tour has been one of the most consistent guys. And oh, by the way, uh, you're going to see a lot of him because he's playing with Tiger the first two days. And his quotes were he, he was so excited when he found out, you know, he's excited for the major, but when he found out he was going to play with Tiger Woods, that he, he said it's going to be the, the coolest two rounds of his life. So he's all jacked up impress Tiger in the first two days and, you know, maybe he gets off to a good start trying to put on a show for Tiger and he contends. Speaking of Tiger, I mean, obviously any, anytime there's a big event, you have to talk about him. Seems like there's not a lot of optimism about Tiger Woods. I know he's in the 20 to one range. He's kind of the fourth or fifth guy, well, fifth or sixth guy on the board in a lot of different places, but he had some kind of pessimistic comments coming into this week about, doesn't really like where his game is. Doesn't really feel all that good. Maybe he's just, you know, kind of being humble or, or something like that. But what do you think about Tiger this week? I mean, is, is this just not a, a great fit for him either, especially with how he sounds about his chances this week? You know, it's crazy because you've got guys, uh, there were several European guys that were talking about what's Tiger thinking with his preparation. He's not playing tournaments. He went on a vacation to Thailand. Uh, he's playing with house money. He won the Masters. Uh, but I think the thing with Tiger, and we saw it at Best Page Black, week to week, physically, you don't know what you're going to get out of the guy. And specifically, if you remember Best Page Black, it was rainy and dank and wet. And physically, Tiger just wasn't feeling good and didn't hold up there. So he's going to be dealing with a lot of these conditions. That being said, you know, I mean, here's a guy. I mean, you, you say he can't do something. I've always said for all these years, 
when he took the stinger out of his bag, you know, he dominated golf and then he went to try to get better. And then the driver was what held him back. You know, with that stinger shot, if he's in this two iron, this driving iron, and he's playing from the short grass, I mean, clearly between the ears and all the experiences he can call on, um, you know, you're probably crazy to discount his chances. Um, but a lot of the signs are pointing to something's not right. Well, and again, I mean, as as we look up and down this thing, I would not be surprised if a guy like Patrick Cantlay won because he's been playing so well this year. Xander Shoffley, who we talk about every time we do one of these major events or, or real big tournaments like the Players or something like that, he saves his best for these types of things. I know some people really do like Shoffley quite a bit here this week. A couple of other names I want to ask you about, and then we'll throw out some some long shot bombs here for this thing. Ricky Fowler. You know we have to talk about Ricky Fowler. I root for this guy in every single major he plays. Runner-up to Rory in 2014 at Royal Liverpool. Ricky, we haven't heard much from Ricky this year. He hasn't been in particularly great form, hasn't played overly well in a lot of events. Does he figure it out here this week, or is this just not the one for him, and maybe we look to 2020? He plays well in the wind. That's the one thing. He plays well over there. Um, so he's got a chance. The problem is there's always one round. There's one round that gets away from him, one or two errant shots that cost him dearly. And, you know, it, it, it's hard to trust him. Uh, that's, that's the one thing. There's always the shortcoming that seems to rear its ugly head. A guy, guy of a similar ilk, I mean, actually, ball striking-wise, you know who's been spectacular this year? It's just uh, you have more faith in him making a 30-footer than a four-footer is Adam Scott. I mean, ball striking, Adam Scott has been spectacular. Um, I think Adam, and, you know, don't forget, Adam Scott uh, had that British Open won before he gave it away to Ernie L. So Adam Scott's a sneaky guy. It's amazing. I mean, buddy, we, we can go through, you know, so many of these guys and say, yeah, we, we haven't mentioned Mark Leishman. If it's really windy, Mark Leishman from Australia is a great wind player. He's one of the best wind players out there. Uh, that year they in the playoff at St. Andrews, uh, they had to stop play a couple of times because the ball wouldn't sit on the green. It was so windy. So if it, the windier, the better for a guy like Mark Leishman. And that's why I really believe, yeah, play a few guys. You know, head in here, settle on a guy you think you think can win, you, that you're Pretty confident he'll contend. Take a flyer with a couple of long shot guys. But my, my betting advice would be don't go overboard in the beginning and watch the first two rounds. And I'm telling you, on Friday night, you can find somebody that's three shots off the pace, two shots off the pace, a guy maybe that's never won a major, but he's playing great. And, and you're going to still get 25, 30, 35 to 1. Well, and this is another one of those, too. When you talk about the weather considerations, you know, if the weather is going to kick up in the afternoon on Saturday or Sunday, and there certainly is a chance of that, obviously, you want to keep a close eye on the weather forecast for this. you got a guy who's maybe four or five, you know, three, four, five shots back with a morning tea time Saturday or Sunday, and you've got the leaders who are playing in the afternoon when it could get real feisty out there. That could be a great in-tournament running angle for you just based on, you know, the, the weather forecast for this tournament. So you certainly want to keep things like that in mind. Uh, one other thing I'll mention, talk about guys that, you know, are great ball strikers that you worry about them putting. Hideki Matsuyama is top 25 in so many strokes gain categories, top five in ball striking. He just can't make a putt this year. So that's another guy, maybe with the slower greens, a guy that you do want to factor in a little bit. And hell, we haven't even talked about a Paul Casey type. We haven't even talked about... Well, you know, Sergio, uh, there, this is, I agree with I, you. This is, a, even though you get a lot of high profile names that win this thing, it does feel like it's really wide open. Well, and I will throw one at you that I'm absolutely going to play. Uh, and for the very reason of what we just went through here in the last half hour, there's not a soul in the world talking about. And you're talking about Rory McIlroy, Graham McDowell's home course. We mentioned Darren Clark. The guy that's coming in here flying under the radar and is having a really good season is Shane Lowry. Hey, there, there's an Irishman at 80-1 to 1, uh, that has won on big stages on tough golf courses, and no one's talking about him. I will have a ticket on Shane Lowry at 80-1. to 1. 
Yeah, and as we look at some of those long shot guys, I'll throw one out there for you. This guy is about 165 offshore. He may be a little bit better in Vegas. You'll have to let me know here. But Benny on. I know that Benny on is a guy that hasn't really finished off a whole lot of tournaments. Maybe you're looking top five or top 10 with him out there in the offshore market where that is offered. But Benny on is a guy that's top 25 in so many different categories. Uh, you know, he's a guy that's played very well. You know, in some of the bigger tournaments this year, he was 13th at the Rocket Mortgage Classic, 16th in the U.S. Open, 17th in the Memorial, 26th at the Players. You know, he's a guy who's first in strokes gained around the green. And if you're talking about an event where the wind may blow some of those higher approach shots, uh, you know, off offline a little bit, he's a guy that'll put himself close to the hole and be able to give himself a very makeable putt. So I think Benny on is a guy, you know, maybe – a first round leader type long shot or a top five, top 10, somebody like that. He's a guy that I'm kind of looking at. What about long shots for you? Well, I think it's that pep rolls under to one. Uh, Shane Lowry is 80 to one. Uh, I, I think the guy to take a look at, I do like Stenson. I'm not in love with the price. Um, so, in, in, uh, so I said, Lowry, pep roll. Uh, you know, the, the other guy, the grenade price, I've said it from day one. I've been doing this on Bang the Book videos, and the guy's a Thursday and Friday warrior. I do think the day's coming in the not-too-distant future once he can learn to string four rounds together. But you know, We're saying that about Ricky Fowler after all these years. The Sung J.M. kid's got so much talent, uh, and I just think this is one of those kind of goofball events that, you know, something goofy could happen. Uh, but I, I think you can go really, really deep here. But my big long shot plays would be Lowry, uh, pe- and Pepro, Lowry and Pepro. All right, so we do and have so another way, golf. We, you know, we, you know, we, did, we didn't talk about, I mean, Mo, Molinari. I mean, you know, Molinari's just this, he doesn't hit it far, but he hits it straight. I mean, of, of the contenders, of the, of the favorites, uh, 25 to 1 on the defending champ, I mean, you know, he's just that kind of guy where people just don't get wowed by him. I had him in the Masters, and he had it one. Uh, let it get away. I mean, Francesco Molinari could be, you know, just come strutting in here and, and just do what he do and hang around. Well, the only thing that we know for sure about this tournament is that at least one of the guys that you pick will finish second. That's the only thing that we know for sure. Ain't that the truth? <laughs> I'm sorry, you man. have no idea, buddy. <laughs> I, 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 I don't like tattoos, but if I was ever going to get a tattoo, I would just – I would make it one of these things where I could just leave – you know, put put up add him to the arm here. You know, there, there's another runner up. I mean, it, I got the Thursday Warriors. I can't tell you how many times but the guy I picked to win the tournament. But, well, how about the, the one week? Uh, we talked about it, right? The Brian Stewart guy <laughs> in Michigan. Oh, up in, up in Michigan, yeah. Brian Stewart. It is, this guy comes out. He's got the lead in the first round. I'm sitting there going, "You got to be kidding!" <laughs> I, I should just bet Thursday and get get it over with. All right, so as we look here, you know, there's actually two events this week. Obviously, the British Open, you know, certainly the biggest. There's no doubt about that, and that's certainly the one that everyone's going to be paying attention to. But there's another opportunity out there as well, and and we won't spend a ton of time here on this one, but it's the alternate event, the Barbasol Championship. We'll have another alternate event coming up, I don't know if it's next week or the week after, uh, the old Reno Tahoe Open, the Barracuda Championship. Uh, That's actually a Stableford event. It's a very different scoring system, all that type of thing. But here in Kentucky for the Barbasol Championship at Keen Trace Golf Club, Russell Henley was the favorite at 20 to 1, but he has since withdrawn from that event. Uh, these are coming from golfodds.com, which is Jeff Sherman uh, over at the Westgate Superbook. Johnny Vegas, who played very well last week, one of a handful of guys at 25 to 1, were the co second favorites after Henley. What about these alternate events? Feels like there's some opportunities to be had here. Yeah, and every year that's the case. And then you could sit there and no one's paying attention to it, but you get a nice overlaid price. Uh, be a couple of guys I take a shot with. Uh, I mean, Jason Duffner, thirty to one, ball striking wise against this group, he should be there. The, the putter's what scares you with him. Uh, I'll tell you, Trey, Trey Molinex, it's in Kentucky. Uh, he's from Alabama. Uh, he hits at a mile. Uh, I think Molinex is a guy. Uh, you could take a peek at 50 to one, certainly a, a juicy price. And just on the premise that for whatever reason, his name came up out of nowhere. Brian Stewart's at 30 to one. 
you know, this isn't in Michigan, though. We, we can't take him unless the, the tournament's in Michigan. You know, what, what's interesting about this one is, you know, you look at the four winners here of the Barbasol. Scott Piercy, pretty decent player. Aaron Baddeley, not bad. Grayson Murray, we haven't heard too much from him lately. Troy Merritt last year. Troy Merritt's played fairly well here on tour so far this season. So this is an alternate event, only 300 FedEx Cup points, only 25 official world golf ranking points. But the guys that win some of these alternate events do wind up being pretty decent players the following year. So even if you don't have any interest in this one uh, because it's a lot of non-household names, Whoever wins this thing or whoever finishes in the top, you know, Billy Horschel was runner up last year. He's played well in the FedEx cup playoffs before. Keep some of these guys in mind. If they have a good showing here, not just for the Barracuda coming up, but also for for the future down the line next year in some of those lower quality fields. Yeah. I mean, but you look at this and that guy that just contended in some big events and is, you know, but he never kicks the door down, but against this field, maybe good as an Ollie Schneider chance, you know, he's 80 to one. But there, there's a guy every, you know, every 10th tournament, you know, shows up and has a great week. If he has a great week against this bunch, I mean, it's the kind of tournament he could win. I, I'll admit I haven't handicapped this one as much, but you'll get a guy like Peter Uline, who's really interesting. He's an American-born guy that plays almost exclusively on the European tour, not in the Open Championship. The irony would not be lost on me if he goes to Kentucky and wins this alternate event at 60-1. to 1. Yeah, so with this Barbasol Championship, again, uh, you know, maybe guys that you want to keep an eye on for next year, you'd certainly like to grab their prices before they start to get lower. But, you know, again, as they get into stronger fields, they'll still have some of those triple-digit uh, or high double-digit prices. Brian Blessing, the host of Sportsbook Radio and Vegas Hockey Hotline. You don't take an off-season, man, neither do I. So uh, what, you, what have you been up to here? It's been a little while since we've talked. Well, I actually just got back for the 33rd year in a row, went back and played in a member guest tournament in Olean, New York, uh, with my best friend. And literally, uh, all I need is the uh, the bloody drag and a fight. I mean, knees, elbows, everything sore. So I'm back for a week and uh, limping around. I get one more good week, uh, take the family. We're going to get have a little vacation here in the not-too-distant future, and then we're back for football, bud, and it's seven days a week until May. So it's, we love what we do. The beauty of it is, and, and funny thing is, I mean, the summer months, you know, we had the World Cup. Uh, we had the CONCACAF Gold Cup. It just seems like the summers, there's all kinds of things that still go on. So there really isn't that much downtime. Get to catch our breath a little bit here maybe in the next three weeks. But before you know, bud, training camps, preseason football, let's go. Yeah, college football conference preview videos going up over on our Bang the Book YouTube page. Got a couple from Brian I need to put up here this afternoon. Speaking of college football, my power ratings will be posted here this afternoon to bangthebook.com, so you can check those out as well. And, you know, Brian, you're not that far away from uh, – I know a development camps already happened for the Golden Knights, but you're really not that far away from preseason games and all that type of stuff firing up again too. So uh, appreciate you taking some time here as always, man. Thank you so much for joining us. Make sure you follow Brian on Twitter at Brian Blessing, and uh, we'll talk to you again real soon, man. Adam, always a pleasure, bud. We'll do it again soon. There you go. There's Brian Blessing, the host of Sportsbook Radio and Vegas Hockey Hotline, KSHP.com, the place to find that, or it's also very easy to just follow Brian on Twitter at Brian Blessing. We'll have a college football podcast on Wednesday, still working out who the guest is going to be for that. Thursday, the Betters Box, our MLB betting podcast, Friday, we'll chat UFC with Christian Pina. Make sure you look at that awesome golf preview for the Open Championship by our new golf writer, James Mazzola, over at bangthebook.com to go along with all the great content that we have going up over there. That'll do it for me. Thank you so much for listening, everybody, and I will talk to you again tomorrow.